this opportunity to organize this international webinar. And uh, thank you very much for our, our all resource persons. So, without uh, any delay, I think we should start our presentation because for Jenny, it is uh, it's 10 30 in the night. So, so, it's going to be very late when she finishes her presentation. So, Jenny is going to, Professor Jennifer is going to present. And, and, and uh, uh, Jenny, you can have a party for your presentation. And uh, I would like to. Yes, Jenny? Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, you you are ready? Yes. Sure. Okay. okay, I'm going to I'm going to try and share my screen with you so you can see my PowerPoint. Okay. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I saw um, <laughs> my presentation is on how restrictive immigration policies um, create vulnerability to trafficking, and I'm focusing on the Trump administration as one of the most restrictive policies uh, in modern times. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but uh, some people have, uh, not, you know, they've switched on their microphone, so I request everyone to switch up and keep it in mute form. Um, I can't hear. Do you want me to continue? Yeah, it is absolutely fine. Please continue. Okay, okay. Yes, yes, yes. please continue. Uh, okay. Okay, so my presentation, I'm exploring restrictive immigration policies in the Trump era. Restrictive border enforcement measures, they increase vulnerability of migrants, women in particular, to trafficking. Unfortunately, when we focus on trafficking, we can obscure um, other aspects. For example, we, we tend to criminalize mobility, uh, particularly of irregular migrants. Um, we create legitimate um, categories of worthy and unworthiness in terms of victims, and we demonize irregular migrants while ignoring the factors um, and the conditions that promote people to migrate. Trump has thrived on these policies, and so I'm going to go over basically his policies over the last three years and what they've done to migration and the impact they've had on trafficking. Um, and so there are basically, I think, all of you who understand trafficking are familiar with those two approaches to dealing with trafficking. Um, there's a security approach and there's a human rights approach. Most governments tend to focus on security approaches to migration. Security approaches tend to, they, they believe that migration and trafficking endangers the state. This results in strengthening borders and restrictive immigration policies, more secure travel, um, identification documents, passports, etc., visas. Um, in the United States, we have a lot of H2A and H2B visas for, um, for um, workers, etc. Um, and governments tend to focus on the organized crime elements, transnational crime, and they tend to criminalize irregular migration. And so the problem with the security model um, is traffic people can often be seen as criminals rather than victims. They can be perceived to be a threat to national security if they don't cooperate with law enforcement. Security models result in arrest, detention, and deportation. Traffic victims are too often incarcerated for nonviolent crimes. Um, and asylum seekers are often deported without hearings, credible fear hearings, etc., and thus they end up being re-victimized and they end up being deported into situations that expose them to, to, to further trafficking scenarios. And so um, many countries use trafficking as a rationale to create in, enhanced restrictive immigration policies and the Trump administration has certainly done that. Um, the Trump administration <clears throat> has demonized migrants um, 
and he perceived them to be a threat to the security of the nation. The Trump administration's efforts have slowed down immigration. They've made conditions much more precarious for irregular migrants and undocumented work workers, and they've created an uptick in human trafficking. Because migrants lose their rights and protections, they tend to become much more vulnerable to exploitation. <clears throat> so restrictive immigration policies, strict border enforcement, um, they make migrants more vulnerable to trafficking. They, they push migrants into the hands of smugglers and traffickers um, and, and actually sort of fuel the profits of, of illicit activity. The White House, <coughs> under the Trump administration, has continually pressured legislators to stronger border security, using human trafficking as the means of an end, basically. And so they use human trafficking to say, we need to control our borders to prevent human trafficking. They don't focus on the real issues of migration and why people migrate. This puts migrants at risk of exploitation and trafficking at the border. <clears throat> on the campaign trail, Donald Trump has made immigration the centerpiece of his campaign. He equates undocumented migration with gang members, criminals, and drug traffickers. He's continually maligned immigrants, calling alleged undocumented immigrants gang members, animals, and an infestation. This, this rhetoric allows him to claim that he needs troops um, and border patrol to address this growing threat of unauthorized immigrants um, and drugs and crime, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Here are some quotes from Trump. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're sending people that have lots of problems and they're bringing their problems with us. They're bringing drugs, crime, rapists. In other words, what the Trump administration is doing is they're demonizing migrants. I'll not stand by and allow our sovereignty to be eroded by laws. Our laws, sorry, to be trampled or our borders to be disrespected anymore. So since, the Trump, since Trump took office in January 2017, he's pressed one of the most assertive agendas on immigration. He frames immigration as a threat to US economic security and public safety. He has constantly demonized migrants and created a, a range of policies, from basically deportation policies, um, admissions of certain Muslim countries, metering, and the most controversial policy that he's created is the migrant protection protocols, which I'll talk about in a moment. <clears throat> Before Trump, these policies are not unique to Trump. Um, the United States has a history of creating various border enforcement strategies. They often try to deter migrants um, by using deterrents such as pain and suffering um, and put, put migrants into extremely vulnerable situations as a, as a form of deterrent. Um, U.S. border militarization sort of really began in the 1990s to the 2000s. Um, they created programs such as Operation Gatekeeper, Operation Blockade, and Hold the Line. Basically, what these policies did, they were a deterrent, and so they pushed migrants from urban areas, which were more safer, into harsh terrains in the desert and mountainous areas. Um, the policies acknowledged that basically what they were doing was putting migrants in mortal danger. The presumption was that they would deter unauthorized immigration. Um, these policies did not do that. These policies really just basically enhanced migration. They did result in numerous deaths. Um, we, see, we saw a sharp increase in deaths of uh, heat exposure, um, dehydration. Confirmed deaths went up from 1996, from 87 to 499 in 2000. Since 1994, more than 8,000 human remains have been discovered in, in Arizona and Texas um, of people who just disappeared in the desert or from these policies. This is just a graphic um, from Arizona, from the Tucson area just documenting the, what these policies have done in terms of deaths. And as you can see, the deaths have gone up considerably um, when these policies started to be enforced in the late 1990s to 2014. 
Operation Streamline was another policy that the United States government um, created. Um, basically, anybody who entered the United States without papers um, could be criminally prosecuted. And this paved the way for the policies that Trump is, is implementing right now. Um, so they basically, what the, the Operation Streamline is doing is it's criminalizing any form of migration into the United States. The alien transfer and exit program that was created in 2008, basically what this program did was it repatriated migrants into regions far from the entry location. Basically what that meant was if migrants were apprehended in San Diego, they would be transported by US Border Patrol to, for example, Matamoros in Texas, which is considerable miles away from where they were apprehended and then deported into a part of Mexico that they, they were unfamiliar with. The idea of this was to try and break the connections with their smugglers. And it was seen as a, a deterrence to re-entering the United States. The problem with the alien transfer program was it deported people into uh, regions in Mexico, uh, such as like Tam Tamaulipas, which were extremely dangerous um, because of cartel activity. And so the United States was basically deporting people into the hands of cartels as a deterrent um, to prevent migration. Moving on to the Trump administration. Um, basically, the Trump administration, when he took office um, in the beginning of 2017, he called for the construction of a wall and other me measures to enhance border security. Quotes from Trump. Border security is critically important to, na to the national security of the United States. Aliens who illegally enter without inspection or admission present a significant threat to national security. So basically what Trump is doing is he's demonizing migration. He's perceiving them to be a threat. He goes on to state that transnational criminal oper organizations operate sophisticated drug and trafficking networks. So here again, he's using this concept of human trafficking to continue his policies of restrictive immigration policies to prevent migrants entering the United States. And uh, constantly his rhetoric includes immigrants present a clear and present danger. At the time of Trump's rhetoric, if we look at how many immigrants are actually entering the United States, when Trump took office, immigration was at an all time low. In other words, irregular migrants, migration in general, was not a threat to the United States. What we have seen on, at the time of the Trump administration to 2019 is we've seen an increase of family units. In other words, families trying to enter the United States fleeing violence, which is basically what these figures are sort of indicating here. Um, I live in the Rio Grande Valley, which is where I do most of my research. Um, if you look at 2018, from February, we had 18, almost 19,000 family units entering the United States. By 2019, we had almost 60,000. So we're, we're seeing a lot of families entering the United States, which are not a threat. They're not organized crime. Um, Trump, in, his, in 2018, he created his infamous policies of what was called zero tolerance. The policy was intended to ramp up criminal prosecutions of people entering the United States. Um, basically, what the policy did was uh, anybody who entered the United States unauthorized, so to speak, would be criminally prosecuted. Previously to zero tolerance, people would be apprehended, they could claim asylum, um, and they would be processed through, Im through immigration, through Customs and Border Protection, to ICE, um, and then they would be allowed to sort of remain in the United States pending their hearings and, and, and asylum claims. What Trump did was basically he criminalized it, and anybody who, was, who enters the United States without papers um, would be apprehended. Um, since the policy started, um, basically what happened is zero tolerance is basically created the family separation, because as people were apprehended on the border with their children, um, the parents were separated and processed um, as criminals, and the parents and the children, sorry, um, were put into detention centers. 
the goal of the, the Trump administration was that 100% prosecutions of people caught crossing the border. Um, as part of this policy between May and June 2018, the Department of Homeland Security began separating thousands of families um, as parents were referred to prosecution. More than 2,700 children were separated. Zero tolerance targeted families. The policy um, did not actually lead to prosecutions of most adults. Um, the government specifically chose to prosecute parents that were traveling with children. Adults that were traveling alone were actually allowed into the United States. This was um, a pernicious program that was d designed to deter immigrants trying to enter the United States. One of the justifications that the Trump administration gave for family separation was to prevent human trafficking. The argument that they gave was they were trying to prevent smugglers and traffickers from entering the United States with unaccompanied children. This assertion has mostly been proven false. Um, sometimes children enter the United States, not with the, the, the parents, but they enter with aunts or uncles. Often unaccompanied kids trying to come to the United States, their parents are, are already in the United States, and so a family member, and sometimes a smuggler, will be used to bring them into the United States, but they are, they're not trafficked. But the Trump administration used the, the whole concept of trafficking to, to close the border. The practice act ended on 2000, in 2019 and on June 20th um, due to huge national, national and international outcry of these children that were separated. To date, many of these children have still not been um, reunited with their parents. And the government actually doesn't even know where some of these children are. This is an image of the court of the zero tolerance policies. Immigrants were brought in wearing orange suits, shackled at the hands and feet, and brought before technically um, immigration courts. Most were not given translators, most didn't know what was happening, and most were, were deported after these hearings. The administration still separates families um, basically, the reasons that they give is that if an adult is, that accompany, is accompanying the child, is not a parent, then they're separated, which is basically what most immigrants um, coming into the United States with children fit that category. If the parent has a criminal history, then they're separated. According to testimony from the General Accounting Office, um, separations have soared since they were technically um, ended. The Trump administration has continually attempted to demonize migration. Um, in 2018, I think we're all familiar with the migrant caravans that embarked from Honduras um, to the United States. Some of the caravans grew to include um, migrants from Guatemala, El Salvador, Mexico, and Nicaragua and other countries. The reason people came in, in caravans was to protect themselves from the dangerous journey through the to Mexico um, and to protect themselves from cartel um, violence. Trump claimed the caravan was an insult to the country. He vilified it as a disgrace and declared that the group posed a threat to safety on every single, to, to every single American. So basically what Trump is doing by vilifying immigrants is he's paving the way to, to close the borders, basically. Quote from Trump during this time period, large organized caravans are on the march to the United States. We've heard that Mexico cities, in order to remove illegal immigrants from the communities, are getting trucks, buses to bring them up to the United States, basically. Should these invaders succeed? And, and note, note that the rhetoric, the language that he uses, he calls these irregular migrants who are fleeing violence invaders. Um, he cautioned working class Americans would pay the price with reduced jobs, lower wages, overburdened schools, hospitals would be so overcrowded, etc. And so he's creating this vilification and this fear of migrants to pave the way for these uh, extreme um, restrictive measures in terms of migration. Trump ordered um, National Guard to the border. He militarized the border. This is an image of the National Guard arriving at the border where I live. Um, 
quotes from his Twitter to read just to, to emphasize the vilification. Mexico has absolute power to not let these caravans in. They must stop them, etc. cetera. Um, Mexico doesn't have any effective border measures. Congress must pass border legislation, et cetera. Um, and, and, and rhetoric like our country is being stolen. And, and this is just another one, et cetera, of him trying to vilify migration to pave the way for extremely restrictive immigration policies. These are some images of the, the troops when they arrived at the border in Mex uh, the US board, Mexico border. They erected barbed wire in various parts along the, the border. Um, Trump um, continued his rhetoric of these migrants represent a, a threat to border security. They threaten um, national security interests and he claimed it to be a national emergency. The caravan actually included individuals that were fleeing persecution and violence from mostly from Central America. Um, and insecurity brought about by climate change, et cetera. And so this is an image of a Honduran boy who is not a hardened criminal. Um, he's not a drug trafficker. He's not a smuggler, et cetera. Um, just trying to come with his family for a better life. More images of the, the caravan, that the caravan was full of family units, children, um, people fleeing violence, um, people fleeing gang recruitment, um, traveling through Mexico facing extortion, etc. These are just some more images of the caravan. The rhetoric from Trump, illegal aliens will no longer get a free pass into our country by lodging merit meritless claims in seeking asylum. So Trump is vilifying migrants. He's claiming that, that they're not actually really eligible for asylum. Um, and all of this paves the way for his extreme um, restrictive measures in terms of migration. So some of the policies that the Trump administration has um, administered um, over the last couple of years, um, metering and practices of practices of non-admission. Basically what metering did was it limited the number of asylum seekers allowed to enter the United States at the port of entry. Um, metering has been ongoing since 2017 until they created the migrant protection protocols. Basically when migrants would arrive at the border, they were told that they have to wait in line um, to claim asylum. They couldn't put their name in a queue um, they, they just had to keep coming back to the border. And each time they came back to the border, they were turned away. This policy basically violates um, international asylum protocols um, because they're not allowed to, to come to the border and claim asylum. Um, the non-admission policy, um, basically what would happen is when asylum seekers, migrants would arrive at the border to claim asylum, um, immigration officials would, would turn them away. And they would basically say things like, oh, we're not receiving asylum seekers today. Oh, you have to have a visa to enter. Oh, you have to get a visa from the Mexican authorities. Um, and so basically, and then they would use intimidation, um, et cetera, to deny access to, to legal remedies. Um, th 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 these policies um, basically left migrants stuck in Mexico. Um, and, and, and basically violated an awful lot of, basically did, violated non reform one principles because they were leaving these people in dangerous areas. The implications of metering, um, Human Rights First, um, a nonprofit in the, based in the United States interviewed some of these asylum seekers forced to wait in Mexico. They, they face dangers of kidnapping, trafficking, and violence. So basically, these restrictive immigration policies are cutting these migrants into the hands of organized crime. They're leaving these migrants vulnerable to trafficking. Um, some of the people that were interviewed included a Honduran asylum seeker who was attacked by men who threw stones at him, a Cameroon asylum seeker who was stabbed and robbed, a transgender Mexican woman who was robbed and then threatened with sexual assault, forced commercial sexual service, and a family pursued by gang members were all left in, in Mexico. 
Uh, Mexican migration officers also blocked asylum seekers from entering U.S. ports, um, including members from the LBGTQ, sorry, LBGTQ community from El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. Refugees with genuine claims were turned away, blocked from asylum, left stranded in Mexico. Um, Mex President Trump claimed that these refugees were not legitimate asylum seekers. Um, Trump's policies in, in 2017, he raised standards for credible fear interviews. He basically um, introduced policies that applicants must show a, pre a preponderance of evidence, which basically means an awful lot of evidence to, to, to show that they um, are seeking asylum. Um, most asylum seekers, they're fleeing violence. They, it's very difficult for them to be able to claim asylum under the best of circumstances. Um, to give a burden of a preponderance of evidence made it basically impossible for asylum seekers to enter the United States. The Trump administration further enhanced these policies. In 2018, the Attorney General announced that people fleeing domestic violence or gang violence would not qualify for asylum in the United States. That basically meant most people that were fleeing from the Northern Triangle countries, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. Um, in November 18, the president issued a presidential proclamation to bar entry of any migrant who entered the United States without papers. Basically, what these policies did was they forced migrants to, to arrive at the port of entries. Previously, migrants would cross the border, they present themselves to border officials, say I'm claiming asylum and then could be processed. These new policies meant that migrants were funneled to the port of entry. At the time migrants were forced to the port of entry and the metering was taking place, was just creating a backlog of migrants, um, the Trump administration introduced what was called the Migrant Protection Protocols. Basically what these policies are is that anybody that claims asylum has to remain in Mexico while the claim is being processed in US courts. So the, basically the policy allowed U.S. border officials to return non-Mexican asylum seekers to dangerous locations in Mexico. Most of them are not able to get legal assistance because they're still stuck in Mexico. Um, basically, as, no, as a, more or less of November 2019, over 56,000 asylum seekers, including 16,000 children, 500 of them under the age of 12 months, were sent back to Wade in Mexico. The asylum seekers that were left in Mexico faced um, kidnapping, sexual assault, exploitation, vulnerability to trafficking, they lacked basic necessities, um, and they were left in a, a rather dangerous um, situation. Many of the cities that asylum seekers are forced to wait in in Mexico are dangerous, with high risks of compelled labor for criminal activity, which is another form of trafficking, um, sex trafficking, and violence. Most of the cities that they're forced to remain in are actually on the State Department's list of do not travel to these, these states because they're dangerous. Um, but the US government has decided to leave all these migrants in these areas. So basically what I'm trying to illustrate is these extreme restrictive immigration policies are making migrants much more vulnerable to um, trafficking um, scenario situations. In December, um, the ACLU and the Center of Gender and Refugee Studies urged the government to end the program, um, basically saying that it was um, that they're placing people in the most dangerous regions of the world. Um, but the Trump administration has ignored most of these things. Um, Human Rights First has documented at least 816 public re publicly reported cases of kidnappings, rape, torture, and assault. Um, of migrants that have been forced to remain in Mexico. Um, a study by the University of California, San Diego, that surveyed 670 migrants in the protection program um, found that a quarter of them had reported um, they were threatened with physical violence while waiting in Mexico, which included beatings, extortion, kidnapping, and robbery. Um, this is the iconic image. So basically what these policies have done by forcing people to remain in Mexico, by denying access to asylum, 
uh, has left some migrants with no other resources other than to try and cross into the United States illegally. Um, basically, this image here, which made international news, was the bodies of a Salvadoran migrant, Oscar Alberto Ramirez, and his two-year-old daughter, Valeria, who were found on the bank of the Rio Grande. They had attempted to cross the river um, because they, they were fed up waiting in these migrant protection protocol programs that they had in Matamoros. He felt it wasn't safe for his daughter to stay in these camps, and so they attempted to cross the river and they both drowned. The conditions in these camps, um, it, they're deplorable, uh, they're unsanitary living conditions. People are forced to live in makeshift tents. There's no access to clean water, showers. They're vulnerable to the spread of disease, inadequate food. They don't have access to adequate medical care. They don't have access to education. Some of these migrants have been waiting in Mexico for over a year. Um, and they're at risk to, obviously right now, to COVID-19. These are some photographs of the camp. This is right across the border from the United States. As you can see, migrants are living in these tents. Um, they wash their clothes, they hang them on lines here. Um, this is another picture inside the camp. And as you can see, there's lots of children, etc. These are not a threat to the United States. These are people who have a valid claim for asylum. These so are just some more images. Basically, what the migrants have done is they use wood from the trees, um, they make their own fires, etc., and they try to cook. It's just another image, and this is right at the, the, the port of entry um, between Matamoros and Brownsville in Texas. This is another image. So th this is actually a drum of a washing machine that the migrants have used to create like a, a makeshift stove so that they can cook. Um, and so basically what the Trump administration has done through these restrictive policies is he's created a full-blown humanitarian crisis along the U.S.-Mexico border in places like Matamoros and Juarez, uh, leaving these people extremely vulnerable to, to exploitation and trafficking. So the current status under MPP, as of May 2020, 60,000 asylum seekers have been sent back to Mexico. 16,000 are under 18, 4,300 are under the age of five, and almost 500 are under 12 months. In other words, babies. Um, migrants face significant barriers, barriers to asylum claims because they have no access to attorneys. So basically, these migrants who are forced to remain in Mexico only 2% have legal counsel. The migrants are forced into what we call tent courts. They're usually brought about 5 a.m. Into, into the United States. They're left in a tent, a large tent. The immigration judge is not president. He is televised from his air-conditioned office, usually in places like Miami or Austin, Texas. Um, most asylum Asylum, asylum, sorry, um, they do not understand what's going on, um, they don't have the adequate paperwork, etc., and most are just sort of pushed back. These migrants wait for four to five hours to be in these tent courts. They, they have no access to water, uh, bathrooms, they're often with their children, and they don't have a lawyer. As of May 2020, only less than 0.1% of these asylum claims have been granted. A couple of quick case studies, because I think I'm definitely running out of time here, um, that I, I spoke to when I was in this area. Um, Natasha is a transgender person um, from Honduras. Honduras is one of the most dangerous places in the world for somebody to be a transgender. Um, she had scars from various attacks. She was disowned by her mother and other family members. She fled from Honduras and came to the United States to ask for asylum. Natasha was denied asylum when she arrived at the border. She's not safe in the camp because she receives transphobic abuse and threats in the camp itself. Um, when she arrived at the the port of entry, Natasha told US officials her whole story, also told her 
victim, that she didn't feel safe in Mexico, that she'd been kidnapped while tra traveling through the country. They told her that she would have to wait in Mexico until June 2020 for her first asylum hearing. Um, there are pregnant women in the camp. Maria fled Honduras with her husband, two small children, after gang threat, threat threatened to kill her brothers. Um, she's being forced to live in the camp in squalor conditions with two children and she's pregnant. Um, I have a friend who's an immigration attorney who has escorted nine month pregnant women to the border uh, and they've been turned away at the border and sent back into these camps. The Trump administration has tried to do everything he can to prevent people entering the United States. And so he has now created a policy called third country repatriation. Guatemala has been deemed to be a safe third country. The Trump administration has entered into agreements with Guatemala, which requires asylum seekers that pass through Guatemala to claim asylum in Guatemala first. Um, the Trump administration has also began to deport migrants seeking protection to Guatemala. These policies started in November 2019. The, from the testimonies of migrants um, that have been deported to Guatemala, some have been deported to an area, it's a jungle area that's called El Patan. And this area is rife with drug trafficking organizations. And so the Trump administration is deporting people into really dangerous situations in which they can be... Um, forced to work for cartels, but which is what we call compelled labor for criminal activity, which is a form of labor trafficking. Um, the Trump administration has also created similar agreements with El Salvador and Honduras. So migrants that try to flee violence, etc., cetera, um, they're required to claim asylum in Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, before they can claim asylum in the United States. Basically, these policies have prevented migrants from claiming asylum in the United States. Other policies that he's created is fast track policies. The program is called Prompt Asylum Claim Review, which hastens the removal of asylum seekers. Um, basically what happens is asylum seekers are given 24 hours to call a family member or an attorney before being interviewed. Um, basically what happens in these situations is they are completely de deported back to the countries of origin, deported back to the situation that they were fleeing from. Um, and, and when you look at how fast these interviews are taking place, um, that there's no time to screen people to see whether they have been a victim of human trafficking. Um, despite the rhetoric that these policies are supposed to prevent human trafficking, these policies are creating human trafficking. Um, just to conclude, the United States is ob obligated to uphold um, principles of the UN pro protocol because it's a signatory. The US government passed the Refugee Act of 1980 to bring the country's laws into conformity conformity with the Refugee Convention of 1967 and the protocol. Um, basically, the policies that the Trump administration has created uh, violate all of these policies. States are obligated. So, so basically, what I'm arguing is that we need a human rights framework. States are obligated on, under human under international law to prevent human rights abuses. Migrants are being pushed out of Northern Triangle countries due to economic failure, violence, corruption, etc. cetera, um, compelled labor for criminal activity by forced recruitment into gangs like MS-13, uh, which, is, which has resulted in them fleeing for their lives. Um, asylum seekers have a, a right to request asylum in the United States. There, it's a humanitarian problem, not a security threat. And so my solutions are governments need to address um, the systemic push factors, the root causes of migration and trafficking, not create these restrictive immigration policies that deny migrants entry. Um, they need to focus assistance on migrant centering communities, vulnerable populations, at-risk youth. The United States could help um, with alternative means to migration. By spending a fraction of what the United States is spending on border security, the U.S. could make a significant difference in Central America and other countries that force people to flee their homes. And, and, and migrants need to be treated with dignity and respect. Um, skip over that one.
and then you can see where that one. And so migrants are not treated with respect. The last couple of images I have, this is a receiving center in Honduras. These are the belongings of migrants, migrants thrown on the floor. Um, these are migrants that have been repatriated back to Honduras. And here's a receiving center at the airport in El Salvador where migrants are being repatriated back into El Salvador. Um, the, um, some of the migrants are tagged because, um, because of the markings, because of the tattoos that they have um, by Interpol. And so, so the migrants that have been tagged, it's known that when they leave these airports, that they will probably be um, apprehended by various gang members, etc. And there are countless stories of migrants that have been deported into really dangerous situations, re-trafficked, uh, deported to death. Um, I can give you resources um, of people that are tracking this. Um, there's, just, there's countless stories of migrants that have basically been pushed into situations of trafficking and, and, and precarious situations through these restrictive immigration policies. And that's it, and I think I'm over time, um, but I thank you for listening to me, and there's my contact information. And is anybody Thank you, there? Professor Jenny. Jenny, hello. Yeah, is anybody still there, and does anybody have any questions? Yeah, th uh, th thank you, Professor Jenny, for this wonderful presentation uh, on immigration policies in Trump area. Uh, before I um, invite our moderator, Dr. Rasmi Pramanik, uh, to moderate the session, I'd like to um, just um, put something uh, in the discussion. You know, the Trump, during the Trump era, uh, Trump has criminalized the migration issue. And um, I feel this perspective of uh, the criminalization of migration has also increased the, um, the smuggling and the human trafficking uh, from the Central America and from Mexico to United States. Mm -hmm. um, most of the time, you know, the, the, this, uh, the people when they do not, they, they cannot cross the border, now they are settling on the other side of the U.S. border, that is the northern part of the Mexico. And if you see the whole day from the from uh, uh, whole northern border of Mexico is now you can find so many, um, you know, the the bar or the you know, the this all this illicit uh, illicit um, uh, business centers, you no, know? uh, mm. and most of them time they these migrants were coming from the south of mexico or from the central america not only they are working in the sector uh, the in the in the sector of exploitation but also they are used by the drug trafficker to transport the drugs you no know, to other side of the border mm -hmm. you know so you know the how the migration from, um, from the central america from mexico and us has the diversifier you know Earlier, the people, they migrate from Central America, from Mexico, just to uh, in search of their livelihood. But now this criminal, uh, the, you know, the networks, they're using these migrants for the different purposes. And one of, the, uh, one of them is, the, you know, this um, drug trafficking. And most of the time, the, you know, the famous case of the, uh, the Chihuahua, um, that where, you know, so many migrants, they trafficked uh, by the, uh, this uh, uh, criminal uh, network, and uh, the, then they extract their organs, okay, and it was sold in the different parts of the country in in, in United States. So you know, uh, and I feel this criminalization of migration issue is uh, you know is going to uh, is not going to help to reduce the migration from the Central America from Mexico to United States, but also it's going to help to rise the migration and the migration of this kind of migration, you know, the, uh, um, this, you can say the dangerous uh, the, uh, part of the migration. No? So maybe that uh, you can uh, speak something about that and, uh, you know, 
you have been many times to Mexico and you have worked so many, you have visited the Guatemala, Honduras, basically is that golden triangle, no? Uh, about the, this smuggling of, of human trafficking, the Honduras, El Salvador and Guatemala. So you, if you want, you can just um, speak something about that one. Um, so with this, I invite um, uh, our moderator, Dr. Rasmi Pramani. If uh, anybody has any q and questions, then she can turn to our presenter or the research person so that she can answer. Rasmi, it is up to you. Uh, the presentation by Professor uh, Jennifer Clark was very interesting. She spoke about the restrictive immigration policies, migration and trafficking in Trump area. She clearly elaborated and tried to speak about the effects of restrictive security approaches to migration. And she gave a very elaborate idea about the government approaches to migration and trafficking. She also gave a very clear picture about the security model and the security approaches to migration and trafficking as well. She gave a very clear picture about the US Mexico border, restrictive immigration policies, and she discussed about the Trump's administration, the uh, of the U.S. border. The presentation also included the criminalization of migration operation, and thereby she spoke about the alien transfer and exit program. Her presentation dealt clearly about the Trump's administration policies, wherein she pointed about the zero tolerance policy which Trump adopted in 2018. That she gave a picture about the Trump of criminal presentation of people caught entering the US unauthorized. She also spoke about the zero tolerance of family separation and also this came up in 2018, wherein it framed to prevent the family trafficking by protecting smugglers and uh, by preventing the family trafficking, by preventing the smugglers and trafficking to enter into US. She clearly gave a picture on the causes of the separation and also she spoke about the restricting eligibility and asylum, the migration protection calls. She depicted some beautiful pictures where we saw the exact, the reality about the conditions of the camps. She gave three important case studies and also she focused on the other policies which were the fast tracking, asylum claims and deprivation. She spoke about the international law and legal obligations and the international law and to prevent human rights abuses. She brought out finally the solutions to this kind of problems by focusing on three important things that is the basic cause of migration and trafficking. She hinted upon the alternative measures of migration and the border security. So <clears throat> thank you very much, Jenny, for this wonderful presentation of giving us a very clear picture. And we have a couple of questions. <clears throat> the first question is, how is Trump's migration policy better than the previous policies? And what is the implication on the local people? Yeah, Jenny, can you listen to me? Hello, Jenny, can you answer? Uh, 
Hello, Jenny. Oh, my control for servers. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, Professor Jennifer has just sent a message to me that our computer froze and uh, she lost uh, connection. So maybe, uh, uh, Dr. Rosmi, you can uh, note all the you know, the questions. We can okay. pass to her. And uh, tomorrow we can give uh, 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 ten minutes uh, if she uh, uh, if she can answer all, all those you know the questions or the queries raised by the raised by the our you know the participants the participants. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. So th thank you very much to all participants and our resource person. Just to um, tomorrow we have another presentation that is by the Professor Carmen Falcon from the University of Comillas from Spain. And she is going to present on challenges to human trafficking in Spain and Europe. So she's, uh, her presentation time is 11 in the morning. And uh, so I request all our participants to join tomorrow. And um, after the end of the webinar, there is the webinar is going to um, end in the 22nd of June. And after the webinar, we are going to send the e-certificates, e-certificates to all our participants. Thank you very much for all participants. If you have any questions, any query, just please uh, drop an email. Okay, and we get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you very much. And see you tomorrow. Thank you. Dr. Charles, Dr. Louis. Are you Hello. There? Yeah, 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 yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, yeah, Charles, I can hear. Yeah. Okay, okay. So Congrats. it's very unfortunate that uh, Jenny lost, uh, you know, uh, internet connection. So maybe yeah. tomorrow we can have yeah. Q and A. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So well, probably tomorrow is going to be a little bit late for you. It's going to be the uh, around 12:30 for, for you. I hope you don't mind. And, uh, if you can join, then it would be now. Uh, be very nice. Uh, say, say what you have just said. I have not get, got it well. Your voice was okay. Cutting. So tomorrow it is going to be late. So tomorrow it is going to be late for you. It's 12:30 in the night. Okay, okay. 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 But, yeah. uh, I'll, I'll request you, to go, you know, Charles, Luis, and Armando, if you can join, then it will be very wonderful. Okay. Sure. Okay. Okay. And um, I, hope you, um, I hope you will not mind because, you, you know, I have to edit all the presentations according to the, I have to keep in mind the, the time difference between the India and other countries. So for Carmen, it is going to be around 7 30 in the early morning. So um, that's why, but uh, you know, it's a late night for you. But please, yeah. I'll request all okay. you know the two of you, mm -hmm. you, Jenny, Louis, Armando. Oh, for, uh, no, for Nora, there is no problem. Nora can join because it's going to 7:30 for her. Right, Nora? Yes. Yeah. 
and uh, Dr. Professor Sikas, there is no problem. We are very close, pretty close to us compared to US, South Africa, Mexico, or Spain. Okay. <laughs> So okay yes yes i have got no any problem uh, oh i'll be there <laughs>